one person you won't get to meet today is the Chris that I chose not to be, but I brought a picture of him. Well, I almost brought a picture of him. <laughs> I saw him walking down a long linoleum corridor about 20 years ago, and I have to say that he didn't look very happy. When I saw him walking down that corridor, I ducked back into my office and took stock of my life in a way that I'd never done before. The thing that really disturbed me was that the Chris that I saw walking down that corridor was the Chris that it was easiest to become. And as I spent a little bit more time reflecting, I realized at that time that the Chris that I was was the Chris that had followed the easiest path for most of his life. When I started working at Digital Equipment Corporation, I got to know the group manager who oversaw the organization that I was part of, and we kept in touch over the years. He was a really nice man, and over that time, he started to share some of his own story with me. He'd started his career working for Xerox Corporation as a young man. He took the assignments that were asked of him. He moved his family where the company wanted him to go and he started to slowly climb the corporate ladder. At that time, digital was growing quite a bit, and they put together one of those offers you can't refuse and coaxed him away, and he came to join DEC as a group manager, which meant that he had people reporting to him in four different states. He told me one day that there was an unspoken agreement, and that that unspoken agreement was that if you work hard, you do a good job, that eventually in a company you become what he called an elder statesman. And when you were an elder statesman, you got some perks and privileges that you kept until you retired. He said that that was basically the agreement for his generation, his father's generation, and his father's father's generation. So at that time, he had finally gotten to the point where all of that hard work was going to start to pay off. And that's when the layoffs began. He got converted into a consultant. He was required to bill 70% of his time. He got no professional or clerical support whatsoever. He ended up collapsing in an airport, waiting to head out to a client site. I talked to him after his recovery, and he was very emphatic when he told me that people my age needed to take responsibility for their own life and not depend on unspoken agreements with their employers. So when I looked down that long corridor and I saw that the Chris that it was easiest to become, I saw him as a ghost-like company man and I vowed that I would never let that happen. So my first premise is that you need to understand in your life not only the choices you make, but the choices that you turn away from in your life before you can really own where you're going. Now, the Chris that I had started off life as started out like most young people, living up to the expectations of his parents. When I headed off to a very good public school system, I added in living up to the expectations of my teachers as well. I was always taught to question and challenge things, but never really to vary too far from the path that was laid out before me. It was easy to live in that deterministic universe, asking and probing, but really never veering too far off from a path that seemed almost predetermined. When I went off to college, here again, it seemed like that there was an easy path. I started in my undergraduate career in developmental psychology, and that was always seen as sort of an entree into the social sciences. I got into an MBA program, and it seemed that they were teaching me how to work for a large multinational corporation in finance or accounting or marketing. So when I got out of school, I was very interested in industrial sociology, but as I cast around for a job, it turns out that there's a pretty strong imperative to earn a living and so I soon found myself on the path as a manager in the high-tech industry, starting to climb the corporate ladder. So we often think of life in terms of the choices we make. But sometimes you need to reflect 
on the things you choose not to do and own them more fully. And further on, I'd ask you to think a little bit about things that you may not even recognize as choice at all. There was a 1998 movie called Sliding Doors, and in it, the character played by Gwyneth Paltrow <laughs> got fired from her job in London and was going home down in the underground. She was running along the platform to try to catch a train, and in one universe, she goes just a little bit faster, and she gets inside those sliding doors where she meets a young man, and her life takes some interesting twists and turns. In a parallel universe, she doesn't walk quite as quickly and misses the train, and her life takes a very different trajectory. Now, if you think about it, you know, the speed with which you walk down a platform really is a choice. And it's pretty amazing when you think about how radically your life can change from the choice to walk a little faster or a little slower. It's kind of like the butterfly effect. You may not think of it in terms of owning that choice to walk fast or slow, but your life can be very different depending on how you choose to live it. So my second premise is that you need to be brave in embracing the choices that you pursue, but you also have to be cautious in how quickly you turn away from things that you intentionally choose not to pursue. My father was a plasma physicist. He was a man of science through and through, and as sometimes comes with that, he had a hard time reaching out to people at a social level, even to those closest to him. I remember once sitting with him at a Thanksgiving dinner while my fiance and her mom were finishing up preparations for the meal. We'd had a glass of Lillet and we were feeling unusually relaxed with one another. <laughs> and we were kind of chatting about personalities. He said that he ascribed to a Chinese belief that we're each born with a certain quantity of every aspect of our personality. And he told me that he was sad that he just didn't have sufficient quantity of that aspect that let him connect emotionally to other people. And I remember thinking even in my 20s that that was just wrong. You know, I always had this conviction that if you reached out to other people, especially those closest to you, that they would almost always reach back. And that as with almost every living thing, if you nurture it, it will grow. Later on in his life, he started to explore his spiritual side and he went to a workshop that started to look at the Native American concept of a guardian animal. The workshop worked each participant through the idea of discovering their own guardian animal. And my father said he was pretty comfortable that he knew what his was. Not very surprisingly, it's a turtle. <laughs> <laughs> Must be a really big turtle. It takes so long to come to the screen. Uh, <laughs> You know, if you think about it, not unusual, not unexpected. A hard shell on the outside protects that which is vulnerable on the inside. And so he was pretty amazed when the animal that revealed itself to him <laughs> was a dancing crane with fire coming from its eyes. <laughs> I feel like I should go over and be a crane. <laughs> Yeah, I was, I was absolutely struck when he told me that. I said, man, what was it that you learned from that experience? And he said, I didn't learn anything because I was so scared by what I discovered that I didn't pursue it any further. <laughs> I was just shocked. I was just shocked, you know, to, to see that you've gone down one path in your life and that something inside of you is calling you so strongly down a different path and to not even be willing to explore that. I saw the conflicts in my father and I thought, you know, there's a lot of danger in that because you could see sort of the, the torture that it creates when your heart tells you to go in one direction and yet your career is taking you in another. And again, I looked at myself and I said, I need to learn from the experiences of my father and not do, let that happen in my life. So, I'd ask you, kind of a shame, I had some really cool pictures on all of these slides. <laughs> this one is actually Sherlock Holmes on the brink after Moriarty challenges him. Um, so I would ask you to think at a, of a 
a time when maybe you've been on the brink of a choice in your life. And I would ask you to think about whether you chose the path you chose because you fully embraced that choice, or did you choose it out of fear for the alternative? I believe that there is an authentic self in each of us, and that that authentic self is the one who really does own the whole universe of the choices you make and the choices that you turn away from. So my third premise is that you can craft an alternate future <laughs> based on fully owning those choices and non-choices. And I saw with great clarity that in my own life, when a very astute colleague made an observation to me, at that time, I was still working for Digital Equipment Corporation. I'd started when there were 135,000 people in the company, and it was still run by Ken Olson, its founder. Uh, during the 1980s, you may recall that we had a tech downturn, and large companies started to shed people. At that time, I had a development group given to me, and I was told to lay off 40% of the engineers while keeping the product running. Now, I had a pretty good professional network then, and so I worked hard with the staff that I knew I had to let go, and I found all but one of them a comparable position in another company. So this colleague observed to me one day, we were out taking a walk after lunch, and he said, you know, Chris, you're getting to be pretty good at laying people off. And I thought, well, that's kind of an interesting job skill to develop. Um, but I thought to myself that that also was an indication that I had allowed myself to give up control of my own career because it was plain as the nose on my face that I had started to develop job skills because of what I thought the company needed me to do, not because it was part of my personal life plan. And I had a growing sense of what I wanted to accomplish in my life, which created a level of dis-ease in me. So I decided at that point that I needed to do something different. So consider for a moment where you're at in your life and whether you really feel comfortable with owning where you are at the present. I'd ask you to think about whether there are paths you wished you had gone down, chances you wished you had taken, or journeys you wished you had made. And if any of those things call to you, I'd like you to think a little bit about the life you chose not to have. So my last premise is that if you own your own goal, the path will reveal itself. And this has been a very strong uh, theme in my life. So at that time, my wife and I talked a lot about the life we wanted to live. We were living in New England at the time, and we knew we wanted to move to the Billings area, a place where we only knew two people. We also knew that we wanted to start our own business because I had been feeling like a small cog in a big machine, and the machine was rapidly falling apart. I had a development group at the time, and we'd created one of the first intranets in the world. And so I knew a little bit about internet technologies. At that time, there was a web server at CERN, which is the laboratory where Tim Berners-Lee created the World Wide Web Protocols. And he had a website that listed every web server in the known world. And the only two states that did not have a web server were actually Montana and Wyoming. <laughs> and I don't think that I have ever had an indication quite as clear as a signpost directing me towards my future. So I was kind of reflecting on the fact that the uncertainty created by working for a large corporation in uncertain economic times gave you the, the comfort of a regular paycheck, but it came with all sorts of uncertainties and challenges uh, inherent in it, and that that was no longer a safe haven for me. So Michelle and I sat down, and we put together a business plan. We found a bank that would underwrite an SBA loan for us, and we started Western Technology Partners, one of the first ISPs in the Billings area. That company evolved into 180 Communications, a full-service telecommunications company. Now I find myself, 18 years later, bootstrapping another company with my partner, Bill Simmons. 
We're taking the latest in neuroscience and helping people to change their mindsets in ways that benefit them. In both cases, we took the time to write a fairly comprehensive business plan and used that plan to help us guide the creation of these companies. <laughs> so, <laughs> there's a nice picture of a lottery ticket up here. <laughs> <laughs> so when I'm asked to talk about starting a business on occasion, I often bring this up. My question to you is, if you could write a winning lottery ticket, would you? If all you had to do was take a piece of paper and write what you wanted to win, would you do that? If it took you two pages to write it, would you do that? 10 pages? What about 50 pages? If it took you 50 pages to write a ticket, but you knew it was a winning ticket, would you take the time to do it? Well, the times that I've been most effective in my life is when I have written down a plan and used that plan as a guide to accomplish the goals that I set for myself. So I would ask you to think about where you're at in your life. And if you're in any way unhappy, I would suggest to you to take the time to win, write a winning lottery ticket. My final word is courage. All of the things that I've talked about, about the life you choose, are ephemeral if you don't have the courage to turn them into reality. I owe one of the strongest metaphors I have in my life to my son, Tyler. Tyler and I built a half pipe. And a half pipe is a skateboard ramp, concave platforms on either side. We worked on it together. And when we were done, he took his skateboard, and he got on a platform on one side of it. And he gingerly nosed over the edge. And the skateboard shot out from under him, and he fell on his butt. <laughs> he was young. He bounced. He got up. He dusted himself off. And he picked up his board and got back up there and tried it again. Same result. He tried it again and again, constantly falling down, until he started to learn that if you lean forward a bit, you have more control over the board. He continued to practice until he learned how to get the hang of it. In order to effectively skateboard, good picture of it here, you launch yourself off the edge of the ramp, and the skateboard follows you instead of you tipping it gingerly over and hoping to follow it. And that's been a very powerful metaphor to me, because the times that I've been effective in my life, I have had to get a goal in mind, understand my pathway there by writing a plan, and then launch myself with thorough and utter commitment in the direction that I choose in a way that I never have remorse when I look back on the paths I might have wished to take. It's been those times when I have stepped off that path surrounded by comfortable surroundings and stood at the edge of a new map and looked at the words, here be dragons, when I have totally owned my own future. Thank you very much. Wow.